So this is what it's like if you're going to donate a kidney to a stranger in the developing country. So these are transplant tourism. You could pay $150,000 and go to maybe the Philippines or India. And uh, these are donors who donate a kidney to a stranger. And they're paid about $6,000 at the end of it. But on the right, this is what it's like to donate kidneys to strangers in the United States. And the difference is not only are they donating kidneys to a stranger, but it costs them $6,000. Rather than them getting paid, it actually costs them $6,000 to donate a kidney. They miss time of work, they have to travel, stay in a hotel, and so on. And um, I've given a talk one time when I was in Spain, and there was some international people there, and they couldn't believe, they thought I was very naive. In fact, they are like, Jeff, you're so naive. These, these donors are getting paid. It's even difficult for other country, people in other countries to believe that in the United States, strangers, just out of the goodness of their heart, donate a kidney to another stranger. Now, thanks to this altruistic donation, they trigger chains. And the largest chain registry is the National Kidney Registry. Um, it's performed about 1,600 transplants as exchanges and chains. And uh, UCLA, you can see on the top there, uh, we've performed more chain transplants uh, than any other center in the United States. And that's helped us have a record year last year where uh, UCLA Kidney Transplant Program has been around for over 50 years. Uh, last year, we performed 324 transplants, which is the most we've ever performed, and 19 of them were pediatric transplants. So what is an exchange? Uh, this was our first exchange. It was a basic swap. Uh, you can see that Jason, maybe I'll use the mouse so the so the, uh, we've got Santa Monica and all of you and Cedars. Um, if I can get the mouse, well, maybe, we'll, maybe the mouse won't. Well, here we go. So uh, hopefully you can see the screen on the other centers. But this is Jason. He's A blood type. He wanted to donate a kidney to his mother who was on dialysis, and she's B blood type, uh, but they were incompatible. And then this is Tiffany, who's B blood type. She wanted to donate a kidney to her father, uh, who's A blood type, so you can see they're incompatible. So what we did is we took Tiffany, who is B blood, gave it to Jason's mom, who's B blood, and Jason, who's A blood, we, we swapped. Uh, the reciprocal child gave a kidney to uh, Tiffany's dad so that their blood would, uh, would match. And that's, that was the first exchange we did in 2007. And then in 2008, we did our first chain. Now a chain is triggered by an altruistic donor. So you have this person here who's an altruistic donor who wanted to remain anonymous, uh, and she donated her kidney to this recipient, Pamela. Now, Pamela's cousin uh, wanted to donate to her, but they were incompatible. But once she received a kidney, her cousin then passed on the generosity to Maricela. Maricela was on dialysis. Her husband wanted to donate to her. Um, they were incompatible. But once David gave a kidney to Maricela, uh, she came off dialysis, went back to work. And then her husband said, hey, a stranger donated a kidney to my wife. I'm going to pay it forward. So then he passed on the generosity to this lady, Inesetta. Inesetta had antibodies to her son, so they were incompatible, but once she received a kidney, her son said, hey, I want to pay it forward. The only problem was that Randy <clears throat> was um, a little bit chubby at the time, and so uh, we couldn't do a donor nephrectomy on him because he was kind of over our criteria, and so he had to lose weight. And uh, a lot of people thought at this time, they said, what, why would he donate a kidney? His mother has already received a kidney, uh, what's, what's in it for him? Um, why should he go through an operation and pay it forward? But um, he did it. He changed his diet. He exercised every day. He lost weight. And about uh, three or four months later, he, um, he passed on the generosity to keep this chain going. And uh, a lot of the naysayers would have thought that he would have reneged, but really people remain highly motivated to pay it forward even after their loved one receives a kidney. And there's been examples of this one or two years later. So in the past, if there was an altruistic donor, here we've got a little halo on this person, this is the altruistic donor, uh, we would just take that altruistic donor kidney and give it to the first person on the deceased donor list. But then with these chains, thanks to the concept by a guy named Mike Reese, University of Toledo, uh, he said, well, let's take the altruistic donor, give it to a, a recipient who has an incompatible loved one who can give it to the next person. And uh, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. 
and you could maybe take this valuable commodity of one altruistic donor and expand this valuable commodity, instead of giving it to one person, expand it by 3,000% and give it 30 people would get transplanted. And so we kind of drafted this, this chain and uh, we made this happen. Uh, this is, at this time, it was the largest chain. Now it's been broken and there's a bigger, I shouldn't say broken, that's a, that's a, you don't want to say broken when you're dealing with chains. There's a, this has been beaten, there's been a larger chain. But at this time, it was the largest chain in the world. It had 30 donors, 30 recipients, 60 patients, uh, it was in 2012 and it was the front page of the New York Times. Uh, but this one guy in California here, Rick Ruzamonti, was a non-directed donor and he triggered and got uh, all these people um, off dialysis. What I should say too is that these people were waiting for a deceased donor kidney. So when they come off the deceased donor list, other people move into their spots. So there's actually a benefits more than just the 30, the 30 recipients. So you can take an altruistic donor and the average chain length is usually five transplants and then you end it to the wait list. Uh, so if you have 200 altruistic donors, you could expand by making 1,000 transplants out of it. And this is a very novel way to expand living donation. It's amazing we hadn't thought of this earlier, but um, anyway, uh, now we're utilizing it. But why do we want to expand living donation? What's the motivation? Well, this is the motivation, is that the demand for kidney transplants are up. Uh, kidney transplantation is a growth field because of our population growing. Uh, there's more and more people getting older, more hypertension, but most importantly, we're getting, uh, we're getting more obese. Um, and uh, you can see obesity is at younger and younger ages. So 40% of the United States population is obese. Uh, that leaves 129 million. And when they start getting uh, obese younger, you get diabetes earlier, you run into renal failure, and there's about 700,000 people in the United States on dialysis right now and there's over 100,000 people on the waiting list for a kidney. Uh, this is kind of the, the heaviest uh, countries and the United States is the, the, has the largest population that's obese. Uh, the other factor is that supply for deceased donor kidneys is down. So uh, you might hear in the news, you might think it's a dangerous time we're living in, but no, it's actually a very safe time. In almost all cities across the United States, other than Chicago, uh, the murder rates are at a 50 year low. Uh, these are some of the headlines showing this. Also, there's fewer traffic fatalities. So there's airbags, there's seat belts, uh, people carpool, take Uber. <clears throat> Young people are taking like zip cars, they don't have a car. Uh, these are all reasons why there's fewer traffic fatalities. And it's a great thing when you're thinking about society, but if you're on the deceased donor wait list, it means there's fewer deceased donors. So the one place where there can be growth is with living donation. And that's where this chains and altruistic donation fits in. So, so fortunately, there's good people out there. There's altruism. Uh, this is a, a nice slide. This is a good, a nice picture of, of a, it looks like a tourist um, giving his shoes to a homeless person. Uh, the other thing that's really helped this is laparoscopic donation. So in the past, when you donated a kidney, you would get this kind of incision and we would take part of your rib out and you'd be in a hospital for a while and it would take a while to recover. Now you get this kind of incision and you leave hospital after donating a kidney, you leave hospital the next day. The other factor that came in here is this computer matching program. So uh, there's powerful computers, there's algorithms, and some of this was developed right here at UCLA. So uh, this is Lloyd Shapley, who's a UCLA, he's a UCLA professor. He actually won the Nobel Prize for this algorithm of how these kidney exchanges are matched. Um, he, uh, he, he's also responsible for a game theory and for the medical students who have just found out where they matched into which residency programs. It's the same computer algorithm and software that he developed for how you got matched into residency. And this is how you match up different kidneys across the country. So the reason for this is why it's so important is that about 30% of people are incompatible with their loved one. So if I want to donate a kidney to my mother, there's about a 30% chance I wouldn't be able to donate a kidney. So there's a large pool of patients that are incompatible and when you put them all together, you use this powerful computer software and you can match them uh, to people that they are compatible with. And this is where the National Kidney Registry fits in. Like I said, they've performed 1,618 transplants. There's 75 participating centers across the United States. 80% of the kidneys were shipped. This is a big deal because we used to think we shouldn't ship live donor kidneys. Well, if I'm gonna donate a kidney to Florida so my mother can get a kidney here, I don't wanna to travel to Florida. 
I want to donate a kidney here and have my kidney travel to Florida. So we've kind of gotten out of the old dogma that we shouldn't ship live donor kidneys and now we do it routinely. Uh, what's interesting is that we're getting a lot of very difficult people transplanted. So these are people who've had a second transplant, a third transplant, they've had lots of surgeries, they have lots of antibodies, they're difficult to find a match. But because of this computer system, we are able to, um, to, to find kind of the needle in the haystack match. And why is that? <clears throat> if you have a pool of 300 incompatible pairs across the United States and you, you run this computer program to make a long chain, you can come up with two trillion different combinations. So when we performed that first swap in 2007, that was just me looking at pieces of paper and trying to match the patients. But now with this computer program, we can really make long chains and get out to that hard to match patient. So the pool composition tends to be getting full of these more difficult patients to match, but fortunately uh, the computer program runs 8,000 possible combinations a second. What's interesting is this slide, is that we looked at the one and three year as well as five year graft survival. So how well are these kidneys functioning? And these kidneys that we're transplanting into these difficult patients who are often getting their second or third transplant, they're immunologically challenging, they're technically challenging, they actually have a slightly better graft survival than a standard living donation uh, kidney transplant. We're not sure exactly why this is. Uh, it might have to do with the computer program being so powerful that we're getting better matches and so you have less rejection. And this is why it's an advantage to the pediatric program because we could potentially get children a better match kidney so they won't have as many antibodies when they go for their second or third transplant in the future. So that's kind of a basic exchanges. That's the basic swap. That's the basic kind of chain. But we've started to do more sophisticated kidney exchanges now that we've been doing this for eight, eight years or so. The, um, this picture on the right are a compatible pair. So the lady on your left could have actually donated a kidney to her husband, uh, but she chose to donate a kidney. So they're compatible. She could have donated a kidney to her husband, but they liked the idea of the chain program so much that she donated a kidney to a stranger and her husband got a kidney. So she helped not only her husband, but someone who it would have been difficult for them to get a kidney. So people are doing exchanges or chains even when they could have donated to their loved one. Uh, other sophisticated exchanges have to do with, with pediatric exchanges, we'll get into that in a minute, shipping live donor kidneys, and there's something called advanced donation, where maybe it's a good time for you to donate your kidney now, even though the recipient may not need a kidney for a few years. So you donate your kidney now, and your recipient gets a coupon that they can basically utilize in a few years. So we'll talk about that. First, enrolling compatible pairs. So here's an example. Uh, this is Karen. Um, uh, her mother was actually compatible with her and could have donated a kidney to Karen. Karen was on dialysis. Um, she's got two children. Um, as she needed a kidney. Her mother was going to donate a kidney to her, but they were, they, they were compatible. But Karen went into the exchange program because she wanted a younger kidney. Uh, and um, uh, her mother took it very well. And, uh, um, we got Karen a very young kidney from a great big guy. Um, I wish I could show his picture, but I didn't get the proper consent for him. Uh, but she got this beautiful, young, big kidney, and her mother donated to another person and, uh, as part of a chain. So this is an example of compatible pairs participating in chains and exchanges. And if you do that, what you do is you, you, you inject a bunch of O donors into the system. And when you inject O donors into the system, you can keep the, your foot on the gas for these chains because most likely her mother was an O and so she could have donated to a whole group of people and um, that keeps these chains rolling. rolling. So these are some of the, the studies that said that, you know, most people are okay with uh, participating in a, in a chain even if they're compatible with their loved one because they want their loved one to get a better match kidney or a younger kidney uh, or a bigger kidney. So uh, we, would we, we would have thought in the past that the mother would have only wanted to donate to her daughter, but what, what the mother wants is for her daughter to get the best kidney possible. And that's why compatible pairs works for the most part. Now, <clears throat> they asked me to give a case, an example of a pediatric exchange case. So this is, 
This is our first pediatric exchange we did in 2012. And um, it, it's a beautiful case. This, this little guy here, he, he had a previous transplant from his mother. Uh, and I think it functioned for quite a few years, but then it rejected and he went back on dialysis. And so this is his father. He wanted to donate to him, but um, you can see uh, this guy here had 90% PRA. So he had antibodies to 90% of the population, including his father. So we put them into the exchange program and we found a wonderful kidney for him. Uh, in fact, it was almost a perfect match. Uh, it was like his identical twin. I mean, it matched on everything. I mean, it was just such a great kidney. The only problem was that the donor was A blood type and this guy here is O blood type. So we really wanted this kidney for him. So we actually put him through the uh, ABO incompatible program so that he would accept uh, an, a, an A donor kidney. And um, uh, he got his transplant in 2012 and four years later, he's still doing great. His creatinine's 1.1. Um, but this was a very complicated exchange or a very sophisticated exchange because it was a pediatric exchange. And we combined the ABO incompatible program with exchanges. Uh, usually those two programs kind of are against each other, but here at UCLA we're like, hey, let's use them to our advantage and so they can cooperate with one another. Um, this is a picture of Paul Terasaki in the top left-hand corner. And if you ever want to see what a, what a transplant superhero looks like, um, this is a transplant superhero. And uh, unfortunately, he recently passed January 25th. In fact, his funeral is tomorrow. But um, I really want to pay tribute to him because he set the stage for shipping live donor kidneys. And none of these exchanges or chains would have been possible if it wasn't for him you know, laying the foundation so we would accept that it's okay to ship living donor kidneys. So uh, in, in 2000, no, 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 let's actually go way back. In 1970, he, uh, he took kidneys from uh, living donor dogs and, in LA and he shipped them to nephrectomized dogs in Sydney, Tel Aviv, and London. And these living donor mammalian uh, kidneys had 48 hours of cold ischemia time and they functioned. And then Terasaki, uh, Dr. Terasaki took the discarded deceased donor kidneys from Los Angeles. So these were kidneys that no, no center in Los Angeles wanted. And the, the, the surgeons just discarded them. He took them and he shipped them to Japan because he was trying to trigger deceased donation in Japan. And the surgeons there accepted them and sewed them in. And some of these kidneys had 50 hours of cold ischemia time. And then in, uh, in 2007 was the first shipped live donor kidney that went coast to coast across the United States. So uh, what happened was it was recovered, or the, the living, the laparoscopic donor nephrectomy was in San Francisco. The kidney flew with the surgeon on a private jet with a tracking device into Hopkins. They sewed it in. There was about eight hours of cold ischemia time and the kidney worked. And the next step was that we actually performed uh, the second shipped live donor kidney coast to coast. The difference was we didn't send it on a private jet. We used a commercial airline. Um, the surgeon didn't fly with the kidney. And um, uh, it, the whole thing cost $550. So we saved about $26,500. And uh, I don't want to get all braggy up here, but um, I think because we did this, is the reason why exchanges have taken off because we proved that you can ship live donor kidneys across the, across the country for a very cheap. And um, uh, uh, before Dr. Tarasaki and some of this, this work, we always felt that we shouldn't ship live donor kidneys, that the reason they work better than deceased donor kidneys is because they're not on ice. That deceased donor kidneys, we put them on ice, but living donor kidneys, we don't put on ice for as long and that's why they function better. But we realized that the reason a deceased donor kidney doesn't function as well as a living donor kidney is not because of the ice, it's because they're coming out of someone who's, who's deceased, who's, who's maybe been in a car accident, been hypotensive, where a living donor kidney functions better is because it comes from someone who's physiologically quite healthy. Uh, they're alive. So uh, we're about to, to write a paper on the first 1,000 shipped live donor kidneys and um, the results are, are excellent. Um, uh, this is uh, a paper I actually uh, honored to have written with, um, 
with Paul Tarasaki, uh, and this is his response uh, when he found out it was going to be published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, maybe it's too early. Uh, this is this is he's an incredible philanthropist. So this is uh, when he donated uh, 50 million dollars to UCLA. Uh, this is Chancellor uh, Block here, um, but this is. Um, this is, I think, where, well, we, we, we wrote a short little report about where we think ship live donor kidneys sh should go. And we think it should follow the bone marrow. Uh, what, what the bone marrow people have done is that it was initially, for bone marrow transplant, they started locally. And then it spread regionally. And then it spread nationally. And now bone marrow, you can do bone marrow transplants by exchanging the bone marrow um, internationally. And that's, that's important because maybe the person who's going to save your life with a bone marrow transplant might live in Japan or might live in Spain. Uh, and the same thing could happen for kidney exchanges is that you may have antibodies to almost everybody in the population, but that one donor kidney, maybe that's someone that lives in Paris. And so why not ship that donor kidney to uh, the East Coast, for example. I mean, if we're shipping kidneys from LA to New York and it's five and a half hours, why not ship a kidney from Paris to New York and just go over the Atlantic? So uh, I think this is where hopefully shipped uh, kidney exchanges will go to help out even more people. They've done a couple of international exchanges. So Edinburgh, Scotland to London, England, but that's still in the UK. And then you got Montreal to, to Baltimore, that's international. But I think we should really try to get over the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, anyway, uh, Dr. Tarasaki, I, I just, um, he, he deserves more of a tribute here briefly because, like I said, he's a real superhero. Uh, he, he developed the cytotoxicity test, the microcytotoxicity test, which is the test, maybe you know Dr. Tarasaki, but I, I encourage you um, uh, to read on about him because if it wasn't for him, we would not have been able to do the HLA typing uh, that allows us to donor and recipient compatibility, not just for kidney transplant, but for all organs. And um, uh, it also went into uh, many other things. He developed the UCLA registry that later became the LA registry that became um, the UNOS, um, which is the big kind of database of what we use nationally. He, uh, he developed the cold storage uh, solution with this gentleman, Jeffrey Collins, Dr. Collins, the Collins solution, how we preserve kidneys. And um, it's, a, it's a huge loss. Um, he also, by the way, started a very successful company. Um, maybe I'll say one more story is that uh, in order to get the typing, the tissue typing, to, to figure out, to determine what's the HLA on the recipient, he would take the blood of pregnant women who had antibodies to their husband and uh, the pregnant woman didn't want to give a lot of blood or keep coming back giving blood. So he kind of rationed it into one thousandth of a milliliter or one lambda. And uh, so he would put these droplets on a plate and you'd be able to determine what is the HLA of the recipient so you could determine which donor would actually match that recipient, whether it's a kidney, heart, lung, liver, and so on. Uh, and he had the trays and the, the, the techniques and it went all around the world. It's also, if you're watching Maury Povich show 10 years ago and you, you were seeing an episode, who's the daddy or something like that, um, those, that's the technique, that's the HLA typing is how they can determine who the real father is. Uh, anyway, he was very successful and um, uh, a very generous philanthropist and uh, he ended up selling his company, One Lambda. Uh, this is a gentleman who was a UCLA researcher who ran the HLA lab at UCLA and he ended up starting this company and he, he sold a few years ago for almost one billion dollars. So um, he's, he's an incredible, incredible man. Um, all right, let's get back on, on track here. So this is something I'm very proud of about our program. It's, it's a, a major innovation. And uh, what happened is that there was a four-year-old boy who was born with a solitary kidney, who had chronic kidney disease, uh, but early stages, and they think he might need dialysis in 10 or 15 years. And uh, what happened was his grandfather came to us and said, look, I would like to donate to my grandson. The only problem is I'm in my mid-60s, and in 10 or 15 years, I might be too old to be a donor, but I feel great now. Uh, and so this, this grandfather is a judge, he's a lawyer. He approached us and said, why don't you just take my kidney now and you give my grandson a coupon? And then he can, he can basically redeem it in, in 10 or 15 years. 
And so we talked about it and discussed it and we went to the various um, you know, groups and we talked about it nationally and we said, okay, let's do it. That's fine. Everyone approved that it seemed like a, a reasonable, logical idea. So in, uh, in 2014, he donated his kidney and his grandson now has a coupon for a future kidney. And the reason this is a great innovation is that I think there's numbers of people who would like to donate now um, but maybe it's not the best time for their recipient. Maybe, maybe they want to donate now, even though the recipient doesn't need a kidney for a couple of years, but in a couple of years they might be married. They might have moved. And what happens is we took this grandfather's kidney, here he is here, this is the real guy, and uh, he triggered a chain. So he was like a pseudo altruistic donor. Uh, and he triggered a chain of transplants. And now uh, his grandson, it's kind of like a Starbucks card. You can just cash it in in 10, 15 years. Um, the next step, Maybe there's a lot of people who are thinking about being altruistic donors because the surgery is done laparoscopically. Um, they also, um, uh, they, 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 they want to help out. There's a lot of good people out there and I'm not sure they've gotten their time in the, in the, in the, the spotlight, but uh, they're saying, well, you know, I donate a kidney altruistically. I know I'm only in a hospital for one day, but I'm saving my kidney for my children or something like that. And I think if this program catches, we may be able to say, okay, donate a kidney now and then if your child ever needs a kidney in the future or your spouse um, you know you can have a coupon and they can they can basically cash it in and the chances of them needing a kidney are very low but yet this could could trigger a whole bolus of high quality kidneys and pump it into the system so this is a new program that we're offering that we're innovating here uh, all right, more about altruistic donors. We, cost, we talked about how it actually costs $6,000. So not only donating a kidney to a stranger, but actually costs them money to do it. Uh, I mean, there's parking. It's $12 here at UCLA. There's travel, lodging. There's a loss of wages. Um, I'm actually involved in an NIH grant um, about uh, talking about what are the motivations and the characteristics of an altruistic donor. And they are fascinating people. And um, uh, this is one of the altruistic donors here. Don, who just participated in the Rose Bowl parade, uh, and uh, they've, the, our, our research findings so far are very interesting about non-directed or altruistic donors. Uh, first of all, is that they uh, they they have they actually make quite a bit of money. So in the developing countries, the the donors who donate to strangers are quite poor. Uh, here, it's the opposite. They actually um, make more money than their recipients. And this is why it's so beautiful to do uh, kidney transplantation in the United States. But you can also see there's a high percentage of college graduates, um, almost 90%. Um, they're very interesting, what makes a, a non-directed donor. Uh, now we're doing um, uh, qualitative research um, that, that involve lengthy interviews based on grounded theory, and you find out what are the general themes and it's a lot of work for our research team and some of them are here today and uh, I truly appreciate what they're doing because it, it takes a lot of time doing these interviews, transcribing them, but some of the comments of the, of the non-directed donors uh, I put here and uh, you know one of the comments was how was it when people when you told people you're gonna donate a kidney to a stranger and here I like this comment it says they were hundred percent against it I thought I think they thought I was crazy. I had a, I told a handful of friends and family. I can honestly say I had one friend that was supportive. He was great. Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. That's cool. The rest of the people, I think, thought I was crazy. Why would you do that? Why would you give a kidney to somebody you don't even know? So um, they donate a kidney to strangers, but they have to actually get through a lot of barriers, including the financial barriers, and uh, people thinking they're crazy and not a lot of support. But when they do it, uh, some of the comments are very, you know, they said this is one of the best things I've ever done in my life. I've helped a stranger. I can do anything since I made it through the workup. I know I can do anything, and it's, uh, it's, we're, we're getting interesting, interesting findings. Um, this is a chain documentary that's much better than me describing what altruistic donors are because it actually follows this lady here, Karen, who's a non-directed or altruistic donor. Uh, you can watch the video at this, um, this website freely, uh, but this is the moment when she meets the person she just uh, donated a kidney to, a total stranger. And um, in the video, it, it, it shows, it interviews her before, after, interviews the recipient before, after, the other people in the chain. But Karen's father, says to her, look, and you see it right in the video, says, why are you doing this? I mean, you could die. You're taking on the risks. You're married. You have children. Why are you doing this to help 
uh, a stranger. And so you can see why they have to get through barriers, uh, including family barriers and including some of the clinicians. Not all the clinicians are supportive of it. So uh, they're amazing people. So what is the future for these chains and exchanges? Well, about eight years ago, our, one of our coordinators, Elizabeth, said, why do we have to have an altruistic or non-directed donor trigger a chain? Why don't we just use a deceased donor? And uh, what you could have is you could have an 18-year-old deceased donor who, who maybe died in a motorcycle accident, um, it could donate a kidney to a recipient whose loved one was incompatible with them, but then they could pay it forward to the next person whose loved one was incompatible with them, could then pay it forward to the waiting list and back, kind of pay back the waiting list. And this would be a nice idea because it'd be a win-win. You're taking a deceased donor kidney, that's a valuable commodity, you're expanding it by 200%, and the person who should have got this kidney on the deceased donor wait list now gets a living donor kidney. Um, so it's taken us about eight years, but finally next month we're going to be presenting that at the regional UNOS meeting uh, to see if we can actually um, carry one of these out. All right, what else is, is the next big thing? What else is the future? Uh, this is a YouTube video that I highly recommend. Um, my daughter showed me this and it's great. Uh, this is the, the largest known star and that's the size of Earth. And so if you're having one of the days that, that you think there's, uh, you're having issues with, you'll realize that uh, you're very, you're just, we're all just grains of sand because this, this star, if you, if you had a commercial airline and you flew it, it would take you 1100 years to go once around, uh, circumferentially around this star. Um, so I think this could be, the Earth is where we are right now with exchanges, and I think this star could be where we could be in the future, because we could be potentially doing exchanges for a combination of bone marrow and kidney transplant. Because if you have a better match for a bone marrow, you, ha you have, obviously it'll take better, and then you could potentially combine exchanges with bone marrow, uh, have a chimerism, and then you would maybe potentially reach the holy grail, which would be no more immunosuppression, you may not have the cancer risks, you have one kidney that would function for the rest of the recipient's life. So right now about 20% of the deceased donor wait list is, is full of people that are waiting for their second, third or fourth transplant. If you, if you wipe out rejection and compliance issues and so on, uh, maybe you just get a kidney transplant, you, do, you take the donor blood as well as the kidney, and uh, they form a chimerism in the recipient, and maybe that kidney functions for the rest of that person's life without immunosuppression. So I'm thinking this could be the next big thing. Uh, this is uh, what chimerism is like, a uh, mixed chimerism. You take the bone marrow of the donor, uh, mix it with the recipient's bone marrow. Um, obviously, not all the cells get along, but eventually you reach kind of a peaceful state where uh, there are the two immune systems function together. You, you can create, obviously, the, the donor uh, lymphocytes and so on, as well as the recipient lymphocytes, and then you would accept the donor kidney. And uh, bone marrow transplants become less invasive. We used to core the bone marrow out of the iliac crest. Now this is what, on the right, now this is what a bone marrow transplant. So now you can just do a phoresis and you can get the hematopoietic progenitor cells, uh, pull them out, you give some GCSF, uh, to trigger them and then um, uh, it's much easier than, than getting a needle stuck into your iliac crest. Uh, so this could be the future. Now, uh, this is, in my opinion, the best part of these exchanges and chains, uh, is the humanity of it all. So you can see this is actually two chains we performed in 2009, but you can see the different ethnicities here. This is one of the non-directed or altruistic donors here. She's in the military, so not only is she protecting us, but she donated a kidney to this stranger here uh, next to her, and then um, right here, and then her, her friend paid it forward. Uh, the kidney went up to San Francisco. And then this gentleman here, um, he lost his son in a snowmobile accident, and in memory of his son, he wanted to save someone's life. So he donated a kidney uh, to that next, next lady here. Uh, whose son wanted to donate to her, but they were incompatible. But then once she received a kidney, Reggie paid it forward to this gentleman. And uh, this gentleman is not in the picture because he was anuric. He hadn't made urine for years. But once he got this beautiful new kidney, uh, he was going to the restroom every 10 minutes. So <laughs> he actually uh, missed the photo op because he was in the restroom. But anyway, just imagine there's somebody there and then his wife wanted to donate to him, but they were incompatible. But then 
Once he got a kidney, she donated to this person whose friend was incompatible, donated to the next person. And uh, what I like the best is you see it's white, black, black, Asian, Asian, Hispanic, Hispanic. Uh, and I think um, uh, that's the most beautiful thing because uh, as a surgeon, a kidney is pink. I don't know what, what their race is. It doesn't matter. A kidney's pink. And if the most compatible person you're, is not who you think they may be, I mean, these people were compatible. But um, uh, there's, something, there's something deep there, and I think you know where I'm trying to get at. Uh, this is them partying one year later. Um, uh, this is them uh, uh, partying. Well, I guess they weren't partying here. This is them on the doctors uh, five years later, uh, and they keep in touch. And uh, uh, you wouldn't think these people would naturally keep in touch, but they do. And they go, you know, in the Super Bowl, you know, this weekend, they'll actually, some of them will be with each other at the Super Bowl and become friends. Um, and they definitely come from different, uh, different backgrounds. Uh, we celebrated our 100th uh, exchange transplant a while ago. Uh, this was here. Actually, this is where we are right here. There's just outside the Tampkin. Um, but what makes it possible? We've actually done more than 166 exchanges. But what makes it possible for us to have performed 166 exchange transplants? More chain transplants than any other center in the United States. And I can tell you, it's our amazing team. And here's... Here's a shot of our wonderful team. I want to point out two people in particular. It's Suzanne McGuire and Jennifer Terrazzini, who are the coordinators that deal with the difficult logistics of these exchanges. But we've got the other coordinators. We've got the, a lab. We've got Elaine Reed's lab. We've got um, uh, dietitians, social workers, nurses, everyone. Um, it, we also have very good results here. And it doesn't hurt that we have uh, a beautiful $10 million clinic. So that's what makes it possible for us to do all, these, uh, all of these transplants. Now, um, the, the pediatric nephrology, this is their team here. And uh, Eileen Sai, uh, she was like, you know, Jeff, I got this picture, but maybe it's a little too embarrassing to uh, put up there because we're all in bunny suits. And um, I'm like, don't worry, I'll show a more embarrassing picture next. But I, I wanted to thank the pediatric nephrology team. You know, we've done... Uh, fantastic cases including that very complicated cases and I think exchanges is, is something that really applies to to children because you can get them a younger kidney too so maybe maybe their grandfather or their uncle wants to donate to a younger person um, but through the exchange system you could get that younger person a younger kidney or a better match so they don't have potentially develop as many antibodies in the future um, I'm gonna miss Eileen she's off to uh, to Duke um, uh, and uh, I think here's the more embarrassing picture. So um, this is Gabe Danovich, who's the medical uh, director of uh, our, our kidney transplant program. And at Halloween, we decided to dress up like one another. So he put on a, a bald cap and uh, went to the gym and got some more muscle. So he dressed up as me, and then I dressed up as him. And I, for those of you who know Gabe Danovich, he's got kind of like uh, squirrel tails hanging off the back of his head, and uh, those are his glasses. And you know, it was odd, because that day, some of the residents and the fellows were confused. They would come up to me in my, in my costume and say, oh, I thought you were Dr. Danovich. So uh, obviously, the costume was good. But um, the other person I really want to thank is, uh, is Dr. Gritch. He's the surgical director of our kidney transplant program. And uh, here he is here. Um, uh, we've been partners for 10 years now doing all kinds of transplants together. Uh, this is when he used to uh, pick me up and we'd go fly in his helicopter. Uh, but now he's more into surfing, which I think is good because uh, we always thought that if that helicopter crashed, it would have repercussions to the program. Uh, but probably, truthfully, we just, they'd probably just hire the next two fellows and then the program would keep going. But uh, I'm glad he's into surfing now. Um, it's not as dangerous to our program, but he's a, he's a phenomenal guy. Um, he's done three transplants in the last two days. He's done, including a, a, a laparoscopic donor nephrectomy where he, he gave me the kidney that I was able to sew in. Um, he's done other surgeries, lack of sleep, but probably the most important impressive thing he's done in the last few days is that he told me he went for coffee and there was a homeless gentleman there who uh, asked for money and and uh, and uh, Dr. Gritch, Alvin Gritch said you know I won't give you any money but I'll buy you breakfast so he sat down and had breakfast with this homeless gentleman and got to hear about his story and how he was a veteran and things didn't quite work out that well but I mean that's the kind of partner that I have and we're a 
we're a phenomenal team. I, I gave a talk like this and one time I said, uh, uh, we're like Emmett Smith and Troy Aikman. Uh, we're such a good partnership. And then someone from the crowd said, no, you're like Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers. And uh, uh, anyway, we're a great team. I didn't know who's Dolly, who's Kenny, but um, um, this is, I think we got a little bit of time there. I was just going to show you the trailer to um, the documentary. It's a two minute trailer. And I think it's, it's great to actually see what it's like to be an altruistic donor and a recipient who, um, who receives a kidney from a stranger. So if I can get this going, we'll see if we can play this two minute trailer here. I was quite surprised. I had no inkling that she was going to do this. Next week, I'm going to be donating a kidney to someone, someone I've never met before. I know people are going to have lives that are radically changed for the better. I know all of that. It still doesn't uh, offset the, my concerns about the risks. We're going to remove the left kidney, okay, laparoscopically. There is always a small chance if there's an emergency that we would have to make an open incision. So I need you to sign right there. My kidney started to fail, just slowly, what they call chronic rejection. Muscles still have some power, but they can only fire for a very short time. There's not enough red blood cells to carry the oxygen. One time, my youngest daughter had asked me, you know, is daddy gonna go to Jesus? This is something that I've, I thought, how could I really impact someone who I don't know in a really positive way? We have something very unique happening today. This gentleman's ex-wife has said, well, you know what, a total stranger stepped forward to donate a kidney to you. I was incompatible with you. Well, I'm going to pass on the generosity and donate my kidney to another person who's on dialysis. There's a chain right now of three people, so my donation means that three people will get kidneys. There is a surreal quality to it. After all this time, this can't be happening, can it? But it is. It's desperately needed, and there are many thousands of people waiting to get a kidney. I think I'm just nervous more about the procedure. I'm still glad that I'm doing it. I'm a, a little scared, but I, I do feel like it's the right thing for me. I've thought about this for over a year. You've been giving a second chance. One thing I can't, I just can't wrap my head around is, what was I saved for? All right, thanks everyone.